Well, good morning, church. If you have not found your seat yet or find yourself in the foyer, you can go ahead and make your way to your seat as we are getting started this morning. My name is Keegan Richardson, and I am one of the student ministry interns here at Trinity Baptist Church, and I'd like to welcome you to our gathering this morning. If this is your first time worshiping with us, we want to get to know you and pray for you as well. We can better do this if you fill out one of our visitor cards. These visitor cards can be found in a few different locations. The first one is in the pew rack in front of you. There's a blue topped card that you can fill out and that you can drop by our welcome center as you leave the building that is found on the left hand side. Or you can drop it in the giving boxes that are located in the back of the room. The second place you can find that visitor information are on these trendy QR codes that we have up on the screen. These are also found on the three tiered stands outside in the entryway. If you are joining us via live stream, we'd like to welcome you to our gathering this morning as well. And you can click that connect button and let us know that you're joining us this morning. Here at Trinity Baptist Church, we exist to proclaim Christ and make disciples of those who claim Christ, all for the glory of Christ. And church, as we begin this morning, all of us are in this room, are going through the difficulties of life. And there are times when the trials of life take away our desire to worship our God. In our sermon passage today, David is facing life-threatening circumstances. And instead of our God taking those circumstances away, we see him draw near to David and display his faithfulness in the midst of those difficulties. I am reminded of Job's response in Job chapter 1, verse 21, where Job says this, The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In the midst of so much heartache, and tragedy, Job chooses to praise the Lord. And this is not because Job was some super Christian, but rather Job had seen God display his faithfulness to his people time and time again. And if you are a believer in this room, then you have seen the faithfulness of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Christ came to us in the midst of our sinfulness and rebellion and fulfilled the Father's plan of redemption so that you might be saved. So church, before we stand to sing, join me in prayer as we ask God to focus our hearts and minds on him, not on the difficulties that we are facing, but on him who comes to us in the midst of our difficulties. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we are thankful for the gathering of the saints to hear your word in song and in the preaching. We ask that you guard our minds in this time to focus on what you have done in the person of Christ and how that impacts even the smallest difficulty we may be facing. Prepare our hearts to sing and hear your word that we may be quicker to focus on your character than our trials. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, let's stand and sing about how God really loves us. We introduced the song, God Really Loves Us, a couple of weeks ago. And if you haven't heard it before, I encourage you to meditate on the words and join in as you catch on this morning. Let's worship church. I've got a friend closer than a brother. There is no judgment, oh how he loves me, I've got a friend, he is my street, and he is my portion, with me in the valley, with me in the fire, with me in the storm.
Amen. Church, please be seated this morning as we continue worshiping through the ordinance of baptism. Good morning, church family. It is good to see everyone here this morning. This morning, we, get, we, baptize, we are baptizing Macy Kyle. Macy is one of our graduated high school seniors, and she is the daughter of Dustin and Kelly Kyle. And then if you are a family member or a friend of Macy here today, would you please stand that we may recognize you this morning? Thank you. you. may be seated. Macy, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again on the third day? Yes. What is your profession of faith this morning? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Well, Macy, based on your profession of faith this morning, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in death, raised to walk in the newness of life. It's always a joyous occasion to celebrate baptism with the gathered church, because when we celebrate baptism, we're celebrating the freedom that Jesus secures for his own. Freedom from sin's power and freedom from sin's penalty, and soon, freedom from sin's presence in our lives. Through Jesus, we experience God's abundant grace, and we experience the hope that he alone brings. In Jesus, we have been set free to live for righteousness. Because of Jesus, we have hope. We have a future. Now, before we continue expressing our praise and gratefulness to God this morning, I want to highlight another aspect of God's grace in our lives. Tomorrow, we recognize as a nation Memorial Day. Memorial Day is a day that has been set aside by our country to honor those who have died in the service of our country, protecting the freedoms that we enjoy as a nation. The fact that we can gather together today to worship our God is not something that we should take for granted, though too often we do. And with the trajectory that we are on as a nation, many of the rights that we have enjoyed over the years actually seem to be in jeopardy. So I'd like to take a moment this morning to honor those for whom we recognize Memorial Day. So if you are related to someone or you know someone personally who has given their life in the service of our country, would you please stand even now? We want to say thank you to all of these. Many have served, some have given everything, and we are grateful. Would you pray with me? Most high God, this morning we humble ourselves and we seek you. We have gathered because you have called us to yourself and you have made us new. We gather as those whom though undeserving have experienced your gracious love. We worship you, the one who gave his life to serve us and to secure our eternal future. And for this, we are grateful. That you, the holy God, would show us favor, rebellious as we are, is unfathomable. We will never fully comprehend your love and your mercy, and we will never be able to repay you for the kindness that you have freely given to us. We also want to say thank you for the grace that you have shown our country. Even today, you are sustaining us, though we as a nation continue in rebellion against you. We have not honored you as you deserve, ever. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves, ever. We are a people plagued with all sorts of evils. We have been people who are prone to materialism and hedonism and the love of money and racism and infanticide and cruelty and disrespect and ungratefulness and disunity and pride. Forgive us, God. Lord, in spite of all of our sin, you have been gracious to us. Today, holy God, we want to thank you for those who have served and are serving in our country, serving our country through the military. For those who have given their lives in the service of our country, we thank you for their sacrifices. For those who are giving even now to serve our country, we say thank you. 
Now, Lord, we pray your protection over our service men and women around the world. We pray for peace in a world that seems to be on edge. We pray that you would grant wisdom and humility to the leaders of our country. May our elected officials serve for the greater good, the good that is defined by you. And God, may we experience a Holy Spirit revival that would break out. May our nation and may we as individuals turn from our sin and turn to righteousness. Lord, only you can do this. So would you do it today? Would you do it in our church? And when you do it amongst us, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we continue to sing and praise God this morning.
now church, we're gonna have a few moments of guided prayer time. Starting with Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, which tells us long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Right where you are this morning, take a moment and thank God for his revelation through his son and in his word. in John 16, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you have, will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Take a moment and thank God for his encouragement and provision in your life. Paul writes in Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Take a moment now to pray for your faith in the triune God to increase daily. God, our Father, we come before you humbly, acknowledging the fact that we can only truly pray to you because of the sacrifice of your Son. We thank you for giving us this time that we can gather together to worship, and we acknowledge that it is only through the power of the Spirit that we are able to point our worship in the correct direction, that we are able to respond to your revelation. We thank you for the Holy Spirit working in us to draw us closer to you through the power of your son. God, we thank you for your revelation revealed to us through your word, through the power of your son. Let us never take that for granted, God. Let us dive into your word daily. We ask that you would reveal more of yourself to us through your word. God, we thank you for your encouragement and provision in our lives because without you, we can do nothing. We are hopeless. We are lost and adrift. But in you, we can do whatever you call us to do. God, we thank you for being a good and a gracious God. We thank you for all that you do and all that you are. In your name I pray, amen. Church 95, Psalm 95, 6 encourages us to come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. This next song, A Thousand Alleluia's, is one we introduced a month ago, and it is a song of praise to our creator, our God, our savior. Join us as we continue to sing praises to our God.
thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand so much for speaking your truth through these songs for reminding us 
Your grace is sufficient. Your mercy is enough. And you alone are our only hope. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for sending your Son and for the finished work on the cross. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this privilege of being able to come to your house this morning and to worship you in song and to read and study your word. Dear Lord, please do not let us take this for granted. And dear Lord, we thank you for the rain that you have blessed us with. What a blessing. You knew exactly when we needed this and you provided. Thank you, Lord. And dear Lord, I just ask that you would please be with Pastor Nate this morning. Speak through him and open our hearts to hear your word. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you, praise team. Isn't it great to have the violin up on stage this morning? All the other instruments too, but. Please turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 23, if you will. Today we're gonna be in 1 Samuel chapter 23 and 24. Well, Keegan referenced it earlier, but Job's story in scripture is fascinating. As we're told in scripture, Job is a stand-up guy. Even the Lord God affirms that he is a blameless and upright man. And if you know the story, you know that Satan gets permission to sift Job, to test him, to put him through the fire. At Satan's hand, Job and his family will experience great difficulty and tragedy. His children will be killed, his property either stolen or destroyed. Satan would afflict Job with sores and wounds, though God would not let Satan take Job's life. However, as we read through the story of Job, it's, certain, it's evident that there were times when Job just wishes he would have passed. When the trials began, Job's theology, his belief in God, his, his understanding of who God is led him to declare, naked I came from the mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But as we make our way through story of Job, what we see is that Job struggles. He struggles greatly. He has a lot of questions. In light of the hardships that he faces, he questioned God's justice and he questioned God's ways. Now, Job's wife had a much different reaction to Job, especially at the very beginning. At least initially in their suffering, she called her husband to curse God and die because of all the pain that he had brought or allowed into their lives. Here's the point. We deal with struggles differently. People respond and react to hardships that we face in various ways. Oftentimes, the reactions that we experience in life will be measured according to the type of the severity and the length of the trial that we're facing. Like Job, the same person may have good days and bad days. Days when our theology is solid and we understand who God is and we can say, whatever he wants, I understand. He's worthy and he's glorious. But there will be also days when our emotions will overwhelm us. Can you relate to that? We see the same thing with David. We saw this last week. Last week we looked to uh, various psalms that really showed us his emotional state as he was battling through these difficulties. And as we read through the chapters of David's sufferings, we might get the sense that this all kind of happened in a relatively short period of time, right? We can read through all this in about 15 minutes. But scholars are very clear this took place over several years. Several years of being on the run. Several years of his life being 
threatened, several years of fear and several years of anxiety. It would be like today if some official uh, state-sanctioned entity was after you. And this would go on and on. Talk about living off the grid. That's what we would have to do. That's what Joe, excuse me, that's what David was doing. He was living off the grid. Another psalm that we see that is attributed to this time in David's life is in Psalm 54. The subscript reads, when the Ziphites went and told Saul, is not David hiding among us? And I want you to listen to the first three verses of Psalm 54. Oh God, save me by your name and vindicate me by your might. Oh God, hear my prayer, give ears to the words of my mouth, for strangers have risen against me. Ruthless men seek my life. They do not set God before themselves. Now, it doesn't take much to see how conflicted and how painful a time this was for David. However, in this psalm, David will continue by declaring that God is his help. Faith in God will not be moved. This morning, I want us to see different aspects of God's grace in difficult days. Okay? We're going to be looking at God's grace in difficult days. So if you will, please stand. We're going to read together in Psalm, excuse me, 1 Samuel. Don't know why I keep doing that. 1 Samuel chapter 23. 1 Samuel chapter 23. Now they told David, behold, the Philistines are fighting against Kilah and are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Kilah. But David's men said to him, behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Kilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord again, and the Lord answered him, arise, go down to Kilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Kilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Kilah. When Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David to Kilah, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. Now it was told Saul that David had come to Kilah. And Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. And Samuel summoned all the people to go to war to go down to Kilah to besiege David and his men. David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him, and he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod here. Then David said, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Kilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Kilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Kilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. Then David said, And his men, who were about 600, arose and departed Kilah, and they went wherever they could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Kilah, he gave up the expedition. And David remained in the strongholds in the wilderness, in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. Saul, David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, do not fear for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horesh and Jonathan went home. Then the Ziphites went up to Saul at Gibeah saying, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds at Horesh on the hill of Hakalah, which is south of Jeshimon? Now come down, O king, according to all your heart's desire to come down, and our part shall be to surrender him into the king's hands. And Saul said, May you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. Go make more sure. Know and see the place where his foot is and who has seen him there, for it has told me that he is very cunning. See therefore and take note of all the lurking places where he hides and come back to me with information. 
then I will go with you. And if he is in the land, I will search him out among the, hill, the thousands of Judah. And they arose and went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of Moan, in the Arabah, to the south of Jeshimon. And Saul and his men went to seek him. And David was told, and he went down to the rock and lived in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued David in the wilderness of Maon. Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. And David was hurrying to get away from Saul. As Saul and his men were closing in on David to capture them, a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. So Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore, that place was called the Rock of Escape. And David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of En Gedi. Will you pray with me? Lord, we look again to your word. We look again to your revelation. We look again to the history of your people and specifically to David and this assault that King Saul was to bring on him. And God, we're asking as we look to this chapter and to chapter 24 that you would teach us, that you would give us grace, that you would help us to understand understand aspects of your grace in difficult days. We pray this for your glory and for our good. Amen. And you may be seated. First, as we look to this passage, we see God's revelation as an aspect of God's grace in difficult days. We're going to see God's revelation. When we left chapter 22, Saul was declaring war on the priestly city of Nob, and we read there that 85 priests were killed that day, but one escaped, a guy named Abiathar. Now, this, this priest, Abiathar, found his way to David, and David promised to care for him. And this is significant for multiple reasons, but one of them is noted in chapter 23 and verse 6, that Abiathar came to David with an ephod in his hand. Now, an ephod, as you know, is a priestly garment. It was a garment of a high priest, and the garment of the high priest would have a pouch on it, sewn into it, which would carry the Urim and the Thummim. These were the mysterious stones that were used for seeking an answer from the Lord. You can read more about these in Exodus chapter 28. So the point is this. In killing the priest at Nob, Saul was removing from himself those who would go before God and seek God's will and then give answers to Saul. In fact, he drove this one priest, Abiathar, with the ephod to David himself. And understanding everything that was going on in David's life, it is amazing that God's grace is given in this moment. The very moment where the priest comes to be with David. Now, chapter 23 starts with David getting word that the Philistines were pressing against a city of Judah, a city called Keilah. Now, think about David's mindset. He's on the run. He's hurting. He's afraid. He's scared. He's anxious. Everything seems like it's closing in. But what is David doing? He's not just thinking about himself. He's looking to the needs of others. He has it in his mind that maybe he ought to go and help these people. Maybe he ought to go and care for these people who the Philistines are now attacking, stealing all their, their grain, all their goods, and coming from the threshing floors and taking it from them. Think about that. In the midst of David's distress, he's not just thinking about himself. Sometimes when we face trials and difficulties in our lives, it's easy to turn inward it's easy to turn inward and only to give thought to our own selves. We may feel compassion for others knowing that they're going through things, but we just don't have the energy or we don't have the strength or we don't have the will or the desire to do anything about it because of our own struggles. In this moment, David is pointing us to our great king, to King Jesus, who in his struggles thought not of himself, but us who put himself, allowed himself, who willingly laid down his life so that he might save his own, so that he might make a way for his own to be connected to the one true and living God, to be reconciled to God. Even 
on the cross as Jesus is dying for our sins, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Not David. David wasn't just concerned about himself. He was concerned enough to set aside his own trial, wanting to care for the people of Keilah. So he seeks the Lord. And his prayer isn't, Lord, please bless them. Lord, please be with them. It's, Lord, should I sacrifice? Should I go and do something about it? Should I go and help? And God says, yes, go. Now notice that God seems to be communicating directly with David here. Not sure exactly how it happened, but God is revealing his will to David. Some argue that David was utilizing the ephod here. He may have been seeking to discern God's will. That may be right, but the point is that God is graciously revealing himself and revealing his will to David in this moment. So he goes and he tells his men that they're about to go on this expedition. They're about to go save these people, and his men are afraid. Hey, we're we're struggling here in Judah. How are we going to go do this? Well, David goes and seeks the Lord's again, and God gives the same answer, so they are to go. David and his men go to this city, and they save the city. And it seems that they've decided to make this city a home for a period of time at least, and then Saul finds out about it. Saul seems to have eyes everywhere, right? He has people everywhere who are kind of informing him about David's movements and what's going on. And interestingly, in verse 7, Saul believes that the hand of the Lord is with him. Oh, God's hand is with me. David's gone to this city and in this city has gates and he's shut himself in the city. Our army's going to go. David and Saul thinks that God is with him. That God's hand is with him. However, we know that the hand of the Lord is not with Saul Saul. We know this because God is communicating with David and he is not communicating with Saul. We know this because we know that God has rejected Saul's kingship and he has sought for himself, David, another who is worthy of the throne, who will rule from the throne. In fact, when David learns that Saul is going to pursue him at Keilah, David once again seeks the Lord asking for the ephod. And the Lord tells him that Saul is headed his way and the people, likely because they're just trying to save their own necks, will give him over to Saul. So David and his people have to go away and they go to wherever they can. Where would David be without the word of the Lord? Where would David be without the word of the Lord? He'd be stuck. He'd be lost. He'd be dead. God graciously gives revelation to David in the midst of his difficulties. And this is an aspect of God's grace. And while we don't receive direct revelation in the same sense that David was here, we have the authoritative word of God that illumines to us and guides us in our own decision making. God's revelation, a gracious gift to us. To know what God desires, to know what God promises, to know what God expects, to know what he prohibits, makes all the difference in our lives. In difficult days, having access to the throne of grace to pray, to seek wisdom, to seek help, to seek direction, to receive grace and mercy to help in times of trouble makes all the difference in the world. Where would we be if we didn't know God's will? Where would we be if we didn't know God's love? Where would we be if we did not know God's ways? Where would we be without the presence of God's spirit in our lives, leading us, comforting us, directing us, empowering us? Where would we be? Where would we be without the promise of his power? Without the promise of his wisdom and his grace at work in our lives. 
Friends, as you walk through difficult days, as we walk through difficult days, avail yourself of God's word. Seek the Lord in prayer. Cast your burdens on him because he cares for you. This is his grace to us. But if we neglect it, if we fail to seek him, if we fail to pursue him, if we fail to saturate our hearts and minds in his word, then we will only add pain to our days. Let's let our devotion to King Jesus drive us to him. But there's a second aspect of God's grace we see in difficult days, and that's divine encouragement. Divine encouragement. David is men depart from Kilah, and in verse 13, they went wherever they could go. I mean, it's not like they had a big plan about, oh, let's go to this town or this place. They just went wherever they could go. That's how desperate they were. And this meant that they found themselves in the strongholds of the wilderness of Ziph. Now, several of you know that several years ago, I was blessed to be able to go to Israel. And I just want to show a few pictures of the Judean wilderness. So um, this may not specifically be the, the specific area of Ziph, but you can see this is the Judean wilderness. This is the kind of land that David would have been moving through and running through. You can see how rugged it is. You can see how difficult the terrain would have been. You can see how, how much of a barren area that it was and how much of a struggle it would have been for David and for his men in those moments. This is where David was. Land that just looked just like this. Hiding, struggling, on the move, on the run. And while Saul couldn't get to them at Keilah, the text tells us that Saul kept up his pursuit of David, verse 14, but that God was protecting him. But then we're told that Jonathan, Saul's son, was able to find David. We don't know how. Don't know how Saul couldn't find David, but Jonathan was able to. But what we do know is that Jonathan went to David when David was in need of seeing a friendly face. In fact, we're told that Jonathan went and strengthened David's hand in the Lord. He went and he encouraged him. He offered encouragement through divine encouragement that Jonathan was able to give David. David was experiencing God's grace in difficult days, strengthening him. Now, most of us experienced something like this before. You go through a difficult time. Maybe, maybe it's a sickness. Maybe it's a disease. Maybe it's the passing of a loved one. Maybe a spouse or a parent or a child. And people who you know, you're friends with and connected to, they come to you and they love you and they encourage you and they are supporting you. And you sense God's presence in their lives directed to you because God is at work even through them. That's what's happening here. And notice what Jonathan said. He reminds David that he will be king, that he will rule, that Saul's not going to overcome him, that Saul's not going to overpower him. How difficult do you think it would have been for David while he's on the run, likely for several years, to remember those truths? or even to find joy in those truths. I'm sure David at times, and we know this from the Psalms, felt like everything was closing in. He had no hope because Saul and his enemies were coming against him. But Jonathan comes at the right time. He encourages with truth, reminds him of truth. That's what's taking place here. God's divine encouragement given to David at the right time and the right moment. Richard D. Phillips notes that Jonathan risked a great deal by going to see David. Saul, already suspicious of Jonathan, was already suspicious of Jonathan, so Saul risked further isolation from his father as he went to encourage David. God was behind this. God was at work. God was was reassuring and offering grace to David even in that moment. And friends, it's the same 
in our lives, in the midst of difficulties, it can be difficult to remember and find joy in God's promises because our mind is elsewhere. We're focused more on the circumstances, the difficulties that we're facing, and and we can forget the hope that we have because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, because of the presence of God's Spirit in our lives, because of the power of God at work in us and through us. So we have to discipline ourselves, again, to be in God's Word, but also we wanna be the kind of people who are there for others. I just wanna say thank you to you, church, because so many of you have been so faithful to pray for me and for our family. So many of you on a regular basis say, we're praying for you, Pastor, we're praying for you every day, and I believe it. So many of you, and we're grateful for that. But there are also a lot of other people in this church family who are struggling, who are hurting. And I want us to be that way, and I trust that we are, seeking to be that way for all who are going through difficulties and trials and struggles. Because we all need to be reminded of God's grace and his power in our lives. And God wants to use you to be that aspect of grace in the life of someone else. Well, third, in this passage, we see God's providence J.I. Packer defines providence as God's keeping all creatures in being through involving himself in all events of the world, directing things to their appointed end. God's providence is how he is at work specifically in the life, the lives of his own to bring about his appointed ends, how he cares for us, how he loves us, how he is moving us in the direction that he has planned for us. In verses 19 through 24, the author records for us how the people of Ziph inform Saul that David is hiding in their land. The Ziphites even tell Saul that they will hand deliver David to him. Again, the king is ecstatic. He thinks that God is with him, that God's hand is blessing him. And, and this news makes him really happy. And he says, hey, go, go be double sure. Go check all his hiding places and make sure because this is going to be it. This is really going to happen. We're going to really catch him now. He, he, he's been able to escape and he's kind of he's sneaky. So just go make sure. But is God's hand with Saul? No. God's hand is with David, and we see that here even in his providence. Saul is closing in, and time seems to be running out for David and his men, but then the unexpected happens. Look again at verse 26. Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. So there they are. Like You saw some of those pictures with a big ravine, and you see them. David's 600 people right there, and Saul's thousands right there, and the end seems to be drawing near when the messenger comes. Verse 27, a messenger came to Saul, hurry and come for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. So Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore that place was called the rock of escape and David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of En Gedi. Just like that, Saul is off the trail again, forced to attend to other urgent matters. Friends, this isn't a coincidence. This isn't a coincidence. This is an aspect of God's providential grace in David's life. Just when everything seemed to be lining up in the right way for Saul, the messenger comes and says, hey, we need you. We need the army. The Philistines have come against us. They've made a raid. They've made an attack. We got to go protect our people. In the midst of difficult days, we need to remember that God is sovereign that he is in control, that he rules and he reigns without rival, that he does what he pleases, that he is exercising his providential care for his own. He cares for you. God really loves us. He is compassionate and merciful and he is working all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. In difficult times, we need to remember that if God is for us, then who can be against us? Now, this doesn't mean that we're not going to experience hardships. It doesn't mean that we won't experience trials. 
doesn't experience that there are not difficulties in our lives, because there are, and you all know this very well. But it does mean that we are not the victims of random chance, and that our God is not ignorant of what we face. No, he has a plan, and his plan is right and good, and we are called to live for him and to trust him. As you suffer, and whatever that suffering looks like, don't forget that God is in control and that he has a purpose for you, a purpose in what you are going through. And we may not even fully understand it. In fact, most of the time we probably don't, but we're still called to trust him and look to him. Finally, in this passage, we see sustaining faith. And we don't have time to read the whole of chapter 24 this morning, but allow me to summarize. David and his men have made it to En Gedi. It's described as an oasis in the wilderness area. In fact, I've hiked through different areas of En Gedi, and they say it hasn't changed much over the years. It's beautiful. It's lush with vegetation, freshwater springs, waterfalls, steep cliffs, caves, all just west of the Dead Sea, not far at all. Today, uh, En Gedi is a national park in Israel. So there's just a few pictures. You can see kind of En Gedi. This is, apparently my microphone battery's dead or something, so I'll just stay right here. This is kind of walking into the area from the national park, going up into the area of En Gedi. You can see the palm trees and just how lush and green it is amongst that area. There's, there's waterfalls and there's fresh water all throughout the entire area. You can see now, those are just examples of caves. I don't know how David and his men would have got to that cave right there. So it's probably not the same cave, but you can see there are examples of caves and this was during a holiday time and people go and they, they, they hike the area, they play in the water, they look for stones, they do all sorts of things. This is En Gedi. This is one of the areas where David and his men were camping out and hiding from Saul and from, uh, from his men as they were being hunted there. So David and his men are in, a, are in a cave. They're deep inside a cave. So I'm in 1 Samuel chapter 24. And Saul and his army of 3,000 people are pursuing David. And as the text states, Saul has to go and relieve himself. He has to go to the bathroom. So he goes into a cave, and it just so happens that Saul enters into the same cave where David and his men are hiding out. Now, all of David's men see this as an aspect of God's favor to David and encourage David to go and kill Saul. So David does go to Saul. He sneaks up to him, but instead of killing him, with stealth, the text tells us, he cuts off a corner of Saul's robe and he lets him go. Let's look at verses 5 through 7 of chapter 24. And afterwards, David, and afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. That David's heart struck him after he cut off the corner of Saul's robe means that he felt guilty, even for doing that. Most scholars I read would hearken back to when Samuel told Saul that the kingdom would be ripped from him, would be torn from him. They see David cutting off a piece of the robe as that, just that, the kingdom being ripped from Saul. When I read this story, I'm conflicted. I'm just going to be honest. When I read this story, I'm conflicted. Saul was not the Lord's anointed any longer. In fact, the Lord had rejected Saul. Later on, we're going to see that David's reaction to Saul's death, and then even further later on, his reaction to the death of his son Absalom, who tried to overthrow his own father, seems to go overboard based on everything that we know. Could it have been that God providentially brought Saul to that cave at that very moment for David to go ahead and end the rejected king's life? Potentially. We'll never know. But God was clearly 
gracing David with sustaining faith in the midst of the trial. So much so that he was willing to allow Saul to escape because he trusted God to remove Saul in his own time. David waits until Saul exits the cave and gets far enough away before making his presence know. Let's look at verses 9 through 15. Chapter 24, verses 9 through 15. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm. Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your robe is in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though my though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients say, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. Note here that David is calling Saul wicked. He's saying, wickedness is coming from you because you're wicked, but my hand will not be against you. Verse 14, after whom the king of Israel came out, after whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sense between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. Right? In these words, David is proclaiming his innocence and declares that he is going to trust the Lord. That he's going to put his hope in the sustaining grace of God to carry him through. And in response, if we were to continue reading, we'll see that Saul will confess his own guilt. But we'll also see that his repentance will be short-lived. It won't be long until Saul is hunting David again. So what do we make of David's decision not to kill Saul? What we see is that David is actually pointing us to the greater king. He's pointing us to Jesus the Messiah. David, as Jesus taught, is showing love to his enemy. David could have taken matters into his own hands. He could have ended his life on the run. He could have avoided the suffering, but instead he simply entrusts himself to God who judges justly. And I'm reminded of another time in the wilderness. After Jesus' baptism, when the Spirit drives Jesus into the Judean wilderness, and he fasts for 40 days. And during that fast, Jesus would undergo the temptation of Satan. And do you remember? Satan shows Jesus the kingdoms of the world. And then he offers Jesus the authority and the glory over it all, Luke chapter 4. And if Jesus can have it all, if he will just bow down and worship Satan. Avoid all the suffering, Jesus. Take the shortcut, Jesus. It's all going to be yours. But Jesus responds, you shall worship the Lord your God, and serve him only. See, David would receive the kingdom, but it would come on the other side of the suffering that he would face. And in the same way, Jesus would be given the highest name and all the authority and over every kingdom, and he will be seated at the right hand of God, but not before the cross. Jesus' holy mission didn't allow for shortcuts. Jesus would suffer the full wrath of God in the place of sinners as he died on the cross. And friends, there is no glory apart from the cross. Not for Jesus. Not for us. God is working in and through our sufferings, preparing us, making us into who he wants us to be as we daily carry, take up our cross and follow Jesus. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for the gift of faith. Thank God for the gift of hope that we have in Christ for the life that is ours because of what he has accomplished in his death and resurrection. In difficult days, don't lose sight of the fact that God is at work. Trust him, draw near to him, rest in him, and know that he has secured your ultimate future, ultimate victory because of his life, death, and resurrection. Do you know this grace? 
Do you know this Savior? Have you confessed your sin? Have you recognized your rebellion? Have you pleaded with God to forgive you of your sin and put your trust in Jesus Christ? Today, you can know eternal life. Today, you can know reconciliation with God. Today, you can know forgiveness of sin. Today, will you put your trust in the Messiah? Will you put your trust in Jesus? He will forgive your sin. He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And he will restore relationship with the creator God. Eternal life is God's gift to us. But we have to respond to what he has done. Will you today put your trust in him? I'm going to pray and we're going to have a time of invitation. And if you need to know the eternal God through Jesus Christ, would you come forward? We'd love to talk to you about the gospel and how you can know eternal life. Maybe there's some in here who are ready for baptism and we'd love to celebrate with you. Maybe there's others who are desiring a membership in this church and you have either gone through the process or you'd like to know how you become a member. We'd love to connect with you. Or maybe you just want to pray right where you're at or up here. God's doing something in your life and you, you want to seek him. You want to humble yourself before him. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for these moments together. Thank you for your kindness that is so clear to us, has been given to us fully in Jesus Christ. Lord, we recognize that there are times in our lives where we get off track. Where we fail to remember what you have called us to, who you have made us to be. But God, we want to live fully for you. Help us to follow King Jesus with all that we are. Do your work in us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and respond as God leads?
together. Father, I'm reminded just of that first song that we sang today, those words, hallelujah, we are not alone, because God, you are with us. And so in difficult days, would we go to the authoritative word? Uh, Would we remember that we have access to the throne of grace? God, would we remember your promises to us in the midst of difficulties and that you, God, will keep us? And Father, would we trust in your sovereignty that you are for us if we are in Christ? We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. You can be seated for just a few minutes. My name is Zach Scoggin and I'm the missions and college pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church where we exist to proclaim Christ, make disciples of those who claim Christ, all for the glory of Christ. Church, thank you for your generous giving. It is a blessing to be at this church. And as a reminder to you, you can drop your gifts in the giving boxes in the back of the room. You can bring them by the church office during the week, or you can scan the QR codes that are above the giving boxes or on the screen here, which will take you directly to our giving page. I have just a few announcements for you, and then I promise you're going to be at lunch before you know it. Number one, uh, VBS is coming soon, and registrations are going to be opening for that on June 1st this coming week, so please get your kids signed up for that. And also, as a reminder to you, there will be no evening activities at the church building tonight. We are also planning to have a church-wide cookout at Austin Park on Sunday, June 11th. The event is from 6 to 8 p.m., and the church is going to provide the meat and the drinks, and we're just asking that you bring desserts, sides, chips, friends, and lawn chairs if you don't want to sit on the grass. And uh, please bring just $1 per person for that. And then lastly, A new episode of the Trinity Baptist Church podcast is now available, so please take some time to give that a listen. When we face difficult days, we can take comfort in the truth that God is with his people. I want you to hear this uh, passage from Isaiah that I read for our college students recently. This is Isaiah 57, 15, and it says, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. We serve the one true God who is high and who is lifted up. We serve a God who inhabits eternity. He was not created. He has always been, he will always be, his name is holy and yet this holy God is near to his people. He does not just dwell in the high places, he also dwells with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit. And he revives the heart of the contrite. So find comfort in that truth today, church. You are dismissed. Have a great Sunday.